All right, let's call to order the regular business meeting of the Board of Education for Monday, August 27th. Um, if I could ask everybody to please stand and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, roll call, please. Jim Batson. Here. Here. Lisa Hessel. Here. Kevin Huber. Here. Scott Booth. Here. Karen Lundstedt. Here. Casey Moody. Here. Okay, fantastic. We have a full team of seven, seven board members. That is. Okay. And a full team of everybody. So um, <clears throat> let me just start out by, uh, well, I'll review the agenda first. So um, we will welcome our seventh and newest person to the board um, and ask her to recite the oath of office. We then will open it up for public comment. If anybody from the public would like to speak, I'll remind you we'd like you to limit your comments to three minutes, please. Um, then we have student recognition uh, and a presentation on community education. Um, we'll have updates from our student school board reps. Um, first shot at it. Let me tell you, the guys behind you left a lot tough legacy. <laughs> All right. No pressure. Um, no pressure. Um, and, but every year the group's gotten better, just so you know. And. Uh, then we have a rather extensive superintendent's report covering a number of issues um, and exciting and updates on some exciting topics, including um, the uh, teacher contract, the budget for next year, the pool, um, the parking at LHS. All right, so it's a pretty packed agenda there. Uh, then we'll approve the consent vote agenda, which we have, we reviewed earlier in the month. Uh, we'll have brief updates from facilities and finance and program and personnel. Uh, I don't believe there's anything from property tonight. No. Okay, and CEDAW? Nope. Nothing? IASB, Jim? No. Nothing. Okay, so we'll be done after um, the update of PNP. All right? So, uh, with that said, let me uh, kick it off. But to, before I begin, let me just say thanks to most of you on that side of the table. It was a quick summer. I don't know if you guys feel the same, but it was for me. Um, it's not even supposed to be over yet because Labor Day is not until Monday. Um, but I just want to congratulate you guys on a fantastic opening and, and kickoff to the school year. Um, I know we had a lot of changes. We had late start. Um, I've already heard in the community a lot of buzz about that. Um, I understand some kids are still oversleeping. Um, <laughs> but what I've heard overall is it's been really great. And uh, I just want to applaud everybody. I had an absolutely fantastic time at uh, the two events of welcoming the new teachers and the, the kickoff day. Um, I imagine we're going to see the Berlin tape at some point. Okay. Um, if you haven't seen the Berlin tape, which many of you haven't, um, it was just a fantastic show. I mean, the only thing I could think of in my mind most of the time when I was re uh, watching that was the book Good to Great. Yep. Okay. That's great. Okay. And, and if you ever wonder why we do some of these things that we do, we sent some teachers over to Berlin to an international, I'll call it teacher conference for lack of a better way of describing it. It was fantastic. Okay. And I just can't wait for everybody to see that tape. It was just extremely well done. And you could, you could just feel the enthusiasm in the audience. Um, imagine that, everybody back at work, and they were just fired up. So that was really well done. The okay. team will be the educational presentation next month. Okay, great, because it was really, really, really well done. Um, okay, so without further ado, let me just uh, open it up. First thing we're going to do today is um, welcome our new uh, school board uh, representative or member. Uh, we had, what, 15 candidates? Somewhere. 21 candidates, okay. Um, so it was a very, very um, deep pool, uh, I'll say. Um, we had some fantastic candidates. We're grateful to everybody that came out and you know, offered their time and services for the position. Um, we certainly encourage anybody that didn't get the role this time to consider running when, when there's openings. Um, but I wanna congratulate, um, you wanna go by Casey? Yes, okay. please. <laughs> uh, Casey, and, and really welcome her to the team. and. Thank Look forward to all your contributions. Thank you. So with that, I will ask you to stand, and I will recite for you the oath, and you can recite it back. Um, <clears throat> I, Catherine Rooney, do solemnly swear. I, Catherine Rooney, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of member of Board of Education of Community High School District 128. That I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of member of the Board of Education of Community High School District 128. In accordance with the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the, and the laws of the State of Illinois to the best of my ability. 
in accordance with the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the State of Illinois, and the laws of the State of Illinois, to the best of my ability. I further swear that I shall respect taxpayer interests by serving as a faithful protector of the district's assets. I further swear that I shall respect taxpayer interests by serving as a faithful protector of the school district's assets. And I shall encourage and respect the free expression of opinion by my fellow board members and others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall encourage and respect the free expression of opinion by my fellow board members and others who seek a hearing before the board while respecting the privacy of students and employees. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual and that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. I shall recognize that a board member has no legal authority as an individual and that decisions can be made only by a majority vote at a public board meeting. And I shall abide by majority decisions of the board while retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. I shall abide by majority decisions of the board while retaining the right to seek changes in such decisions through ethical and constructive channels. All right, so welcome. Um, Thank you. Welcome to Pat, can I interrupt for just a second? Yes, you may. So I have a gift for you. It's really from Pat and Jim and I. So okay. if you'd like to open it up, you'll see why. Okay. <laughs> This Thank is you. this is from my private collection. <laughs> you can open that up. Um, you mentioned that you're going to be having a tour for your first time at Vernon Hills High School, oh, and we wanted to be you. sure that as that Vernon I'm dressed Hills delegates that we uh, <laughs> provide you with the right swag. Well, thank you very much. Wow. All right. <laughs> So it's so time to balance. Now it. you have some time. <laughs> <laughs> I've been right. doing this for four years. I'm still waiting for my attire. <laughs> Good work, bro. You're getting closer. Yep. You're getting closer. Casey, do you want to say anything? Oh, um, well, thank you. I'm honored to be here, and I, I look forward to the, continuing the good work that this board has done over the years and working with all these wonderful people seated at this table. Thank you. All right, great. And again, a special thanks to um, not only our fellow board members, but uh, Brian, you in particular, who did the lion's share of the work of organizing. Imagine organizing, uh, screening 20 candidates was no small feat. And uh, Brian does a fantastic job of doing that, especially after having already done it about a month earlier for almost as many uh, candidates. So appreciate all the hard work of everybody that was involved. And that first one worked out pretty good too, I think. First one worked out okay too. Yeah. <laughs> she brings great gifts too. Um, she brings gifts. All right. So next, um, is anybody here from the public who would like to speak tonight? Go ahead. Just recite your name and address for the record so we yes, get that on, on the table. My name is Jim McCormack. I live at 815 into Lake and Lane, Libertyville. I've been there since 1982, 36 years. My attendance tonight is uh, mostly prompted by a report that I read in the Daily Herald in which the district approved an 11% increase in spending and a $105 million budget and not one member of the public attended that meeting, which lasted 20 minutes. I was flabbergasted that no one attended that meeting. Given the fact that I've lived here for 36 years, it's obvious that I'm a little bit older than most members of the community, but I formerly served as chairman of the Economic Commission of the Village of Libertyville, chairman of the Finance Committee of the Lake County Economic Commission and in various other posts, and I attended many board meetings of this district as well as District 70. I'm here just to uh, say that uh, I, I am flabbergasted that no one from the public attended the meeting. That was a very important meeting. I read the Daily Herald every single day. I keep aware of local events, and I didn't even know that meeting was taking place. I would have attended. And so I would ask that uh, communication between the board and the community be improved. I did speak to Mr. Dan Stanley, who was very helpful and very professional, and I thank him very much. Uh, but. Uh, he referred me to the D128.gov or .org, and the meetings are scheduled there. 
but I don't know if that's an adequate way to communicate when meetings will take place. So I would ask the board to improve upon that unless I'm not getting something that I should be. So I ask you for that. The second thing I want to point out is that, uh, as you know, uh, the great part of people's tax bills in Lake County and in the local area are generated by education. 70%, in fact, of my tax bill is between 128 and District 70. <clears throat> and the problem is that people's income are not increasing enough to pay the increase in taxes. In fact, there's, ver there's various organizations being organized right now to, you know, as a tax revolt against the, the taxes that are levied. In the village of Libertyville or in Lake County, I understand the average tax rate is 2.67%. And this is causing a lot of people to leave Illinois and leave Lake County. There are 35,000 people leaving Illinois each year based upon the latest statistics that I know. And according to Mr. Stanley, if I heard correctly, the District 128 has $125 million in cash. And so I would ask, why do we have to have, in that article, in the Daily Herald, there was $20 million for a new pool, $25 million for what I consider, or you know, would be considered luxury items for Vernon Hills High School, when people can't even afford to pay the tax bills that they are doing now. It is driving people out of the state of Illinois. So I would ask this board to be cognizant of that fact and to try to not just to be limited by the statutory CPI inflation on tax bills, but to use some of the cash reserves in this interim period to reduce the tax levy and to reduce taxes on people throughout the community. And I respectfully submit that. And I would, I would add that, as you know, under the new federal tax bill, the federal, uh, you can limit your salt taxes, that is real estate taxes and others, to only $10,000. So most people won't be itemizing anymore. They will be taking the standard deduction. And depending upon your income, that will increase your taxes rather than lowering them. So I would ask that the board to consider not just communicating better, but to also reduce the amount of spending in the future so that people can stay not only in the local community, but in the state of Illinois. I thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your comments. Anyone else who would like to speak? Okay, next, uh, student recognition tonight. Who's got that? I got some. Dr. Gilliam. Good evening, as uh, Dr. Grudy said, the summer went quickly, but uh, we still had some good things that were happening over the summer. So tonight we get a chance to celebrate a couple uh, of those that uh, happened here at Vernon Hills with our kids. Uh, and the first is something that has become uh, quite habitual here in this first uh, board meeting of the year, and that is to recognize some uh, national uh, winners and uh, placers uh, with our FBLA, Future Business Leaders of America. The last few years has uh, really excelled, uh, winning on the state level uh, in the spring, and then always sending a pretty strong contingency uh, to the national event in the summer. So uh, we said goodbye to Diane Phillips in the spring when she was up here as she uh, is retiring from her post uh, as coach and also uh, an administrator here in the district. But over the summer, we had her with us one more time to uh, work with these students. So this time I'd like to bring Diane Phillips up. And should I bring Tony Isabelli up too? And Sebastian. And Sebastian. Come on up, the three of you. And uh, Diane, you can talk a little bit about this award. Actually, Tony's going to talk about this. Tony Sebastian. Isabelli is going to do it. Yep. Hi, everyone. My name is Tony Isabelli. And for those of you who don't know me, I've been teaching English here for 25 years. And over the past three years, I have been working with, I've been working with uh, Diane Phillips, legendary Diane Phillips, and Lynn Benson. Uh, as co-advisor for FBLA. Um, and it has been just a real treat to work with, with them and watch these kids really grow. Um, working with the kids in FBLA has been a great experience and I can't say enough good about our students. I'm very proud to be part of this organization. Tonight, rather than having the advisors announce our winners at uh, nationals in Baltimore, Maryland, 
I'd like to turn it over to Sebastian to Dominique, who will talk about our events that took place at the end of June. Okay. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here today in front of our Board of Education and Administration announcing our FBLA national winners. However, before I do so, I can't go on without giving a huge thank you to our advisors, Mr. Zabelli, Ms. Benson, and Ms. Phillips. I've only seen a fraction of the men's work that they've put into FBLA to make it a possibility. So on behalf of myself as FBLA president and on behalf of the student body that makes up the Vernon Hills High School FBLA chapter, we'd like to thank you very much for everything that the three of you have done to make this a possibility and an experience that is absolutely unforgettable. FBLA has allowed our students incredible opportunities, such as national conferences, where we were given the chance to create a family-like bond, not only between our own peers, but between students around the world, including China, Canada, and even Dom Dominican Republic. With that said, nationals at, Bal at Baltimore, Maryland, was no achievement to be taken lightly. There were thousands of students from around the globe who competed throughout the five-day conference, not including the students who competed against those nationalists within their own state, regional, and area competitions. So without further ado, I would like to announce our FBLA chapter winners. There were a total of 21 natu national qualifiers from Vernon Hills High School. Out of those 22, 21, we had five placed at this national level. And if you could come up and receive your certificates when I announce your names. Um, so first off, we had Thomas Florian, who earned ninth place at, on an event titled Help Desk. Thomas's mom will be accepting for him. He's at a golf meet right now. <laughs> <laughs> then we have Daniel Zhuang, who earned eighth place for cybersecurity. He'll say a few things about the competition. Okay, um, yeah, my name is Daniel Zhuang, and I'm a sophomore here at Vernon Hills High School. And uh, my event was cyber security, and it was just a uh, multiple choice testing event in which there, were, there was 100 questions from topics um, relating to cyber security, including networking, uh, forensics, uh, and physical security. And uh, yeah, my goal was to achieve the highest score possible on the uh, multiple choice exam. We also have Rachel Chuang and Sarah Weisblatt, who earned sixth place for hospitality management. You want to talk. <laughs> okay. um, and then finally, Anmol Prande, who is now attending University of California, Berkeley, as a computer science major, earned third place for a management information system. As a junior in FBLA, I'm so proud of these five competitors' achievements and to be a part of this organization. Thank you so much for your time, and have a wonderful evening. Okay, Peyton, come on up. <laughs> so, um, there she is. Just stand here. So, this is Peyton Newman. We have an opportunity tonight to recognize Peyton. Uh, every once in a while, there'll be an event that happens where uh, it's not necessarily a school-sanctioned event, like a like a school's FBLA, FBLA program. But we send someone out, uh, kind of on our behalf, and she represents us well. Uh, well enough that we want to uh, recognize her tonight. And Peyton uh, is that for us tonight. Uh, Peyton Newman is a sophomore here, right? Junior. Junior. She was a sophomore when this happened. Um, 
Last January, won the recognition of Miss Chicago's Outstanding Team. Uh, so that was in January. Uh, how many did you go against in that? Remember? Like, not too many. It's a local. Okay, so a local one. So Miss Chicago. Uh, then we sent her off uh, in June uh, to comp compete in the Miss Illinois Outstanding Team, and she won that. So in June, uh, you competed against how many uh, other local winners? 22. Uh, competes against 22 other local and wins Miss uh, Illinois outstanding team. Uh, so a after that, sh she goes down to Orlando, right? Yes. Competes in Orlando. While, uh, well, let me go back. While uh, competing on the Illinois um, level, she won uh, top overall, overall fitness. Uh, watch out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, also top newcomer score, because that was your first competition yep. in this. All right, then we sent her, like I said, we sent her down to Orlando, Florida, and she competed on a national level, a uh, winner from every state, I presume, mm -hmm. correct? Right, and uh, though she didn't win uh, Miss, uh, Miss America, Miss, Miss America Outstanding Team, right, yeah. is that what it's called? Uh, she did win this, let me read this. She won a national award for onstage question and evening gown performance. Uh, she was also recognized as a top 10 in the nation finalist for Teens in Action. Community Service Award. And in a second, I'll talk a little bit about her community service. Uh, but through that organization was awarded uh, half a dozen or so college scholarships already, correct? Uh, full rides to those institutions. So you'll have uh, some decisions here coming up, right? Yeah. Sounds good. Uh, but maybe most importantly and probably most impressively is the work that Peyton is doing uh, at a service level. So I want to read just a little bit about what Peyton is doing uh, on a service level, and again, she was recognized for that when she competed down in Florida. Uh, for the past six years, Peyton has advocated for increased community service and volunteerism through her charity, My Voice. My Voice seeks to empower teens and adolescents to be heard by becoming engaged members of the communities they live in and to make a difference. Her website promotes volunteer and community service opportunities as well as highlighting the actions of those who volunteer. Her current project, hashtag Volunteen Illinois, is focused on helping Illinois teenage volunteers find opportunities to pay it forward, whether they are first time or current volunteer seeking a new experience. I had an opportunity to talk to Peyton uh, a couple weeks ago about some of her initiatives uh, and really some outstanding work. We're really proud of her and I uh, want to take this opportunity tonight to congratulate her. So congratulations. I would just like to say how much of an honor it has to be a student at Vernon Hills High School. It's a really amazing school and I thank you for all the work that you've been putting in as our Board of Education. So thank you so much for having me tonight. to the education presentation for this evening. Um, this is our favorite thing for the parents and uh, family members. This is a favorite thing that we all do. Um, you know, once a month at the district level to really celebrate the success of the kids at, at LHS and VHHS. So, uh, but we know that hasn't happened in a vacuum and it didn't happen by chance. We know that uh, parents and families and friends uh, have worked to support these young people. So we want to take a minute and ask the parents and family members to stand. Don't be bashful. And uh, let's give you all a round of applause. Now, uh, before we transition, uh, you can certainly remain for the rest of the board meeting. Uh, and um, if you choose not to do that, then you can just exit um, and go. Okay, so no expectation either way. All right? <laughs>
Okay, next we have a presentation on community education. And that would be Diane Phillips. Good, e good evening, how are you tonight? I'm so proud of the FBLA kids, yeah. but I am proud to be the director of the community, community education program for District 128. And it's hard to believe that we're celebrating our 70th anniversary this year. So I'm gonna walk you through a little bit of history and bring you back to where we are today. Oops. It went really quick just like the summer. 1948, when it all started, the program was sponsored by the Board of Education of Libertyville Township High School District. Um, and our pro the program is still financed only by tuition. And what basically that means is that if there are not enough registrations to cover the salary of the instructor and the overhead costs that are associated with the program, the class is canceled. We um, offer or back then, I wasn't here back then. Um, senior citizens age 62 and above um, had their tuition reduced by up to 50%. Classes met at Libertyville High School and participants had to actually go to the Butler Lake campus in order to register for the class. So now I'm gonna take you briefly through each decade um, and just highlight some of the classes. I did a lot of history um, putting together for the 100 year celebration and it is just so cool, the classes that they had when I was a child, 1960. The directors were Leon, um, and I'm not gonna try to pronounce his last name, um, John Fuchs and Don, Donald Gossett, um, familiar name to us. And the program itself was broken into four different sections. Um, and if you think way back in the 60s, you can see how much the program has changed in that time period. Class offerings in business and social improvement um, were a lot of language type courses. The basic slide rule, which was pictured, and um, personal typing, a favorite of mine being a business teacher, um, and stenographic machines. And in the learn to enjoy life section, there was bridge, golf, driver training, women's slim and trim, and four men only class. Didn't have a really good description, but it talked that it was just for men. Um, in the homemaker class section, there was cake decorating, um, cooking, um, millinery, um, making hats, sewing and knitting. And then in the develop skills section, there was shop math, basic electronics, and flight school. And our first um, program that I found uh, from 1964, there were 42 classes that were offered. Now let's go into the 70s. Don Gossett was still one of the um, directors and Randy Carson came on board. And some of the class offerings that we had at that time were macrame, um, exercise through belly dancing, microwave cooking, uh, men's recreation, women's recreation, still separated, um, golf, bridge, Learn to Swim program started in our district, so back in the 70s. And then how to tune up your car. I'm guessing that was a male class. Um, and in terms of averaging the number of classes that we offered per term, we were at 49. The 80s. In the 80s, we had Robert Hart and Gary Hodg Hodgson's um, as our directors. And we started offering woodworking, self-defense for women disco dance, um, needlepoint, um, walk cookery, um, aerobics, um, and what I thought was interesting, baking for men, and changing roles of women and men and women affects on the family, because remember at that point, women were starting to go into the workforce. We'll go into the 90s. In the 90s, Gary was still our director and Buzz Perry came on board. Our class offerings, bow making, um, consumer survival tactics, a lot of computer oriented classes um, and we stopped smoking or tried to help people stop smoking. Um, and we offered dance lessons probably to offset stopping smoking and we had aerobic classes. 
and our number of classes offered per term continued to increase in the 2000s. I kind of grouped this one all together. Um, Buzz was still um, the director, and then I came on board eight years ago. And who in the, in the 2000s couldn't be bedazzled? Smile a little. That, Some that, people that, know what bedazzled that, is. That. Um, why should I take an internet course? Um, eBay, Photoshop, um, vegetarian cooking, time management. Um, we started offering STEM classes through Engineering for Kids. Um, we are going to offer Drone 101 um, coming into the future. Um, we have fire safety and extinguisher training and um, Facebook, LinkedIn, um, self-defense training through Braveway and um, job seekers, job hunting on an online error. error. It's not an error, it's an error. <laughs> it's happening now. Um, and if you notice from 1964 when we offered 48 classes, we're now averaging 178 classes per term. So. In 1998, when we celebrated our 50th anniversary, um, we, I shouldn't say we, but um, the first website was developed for the program. Um, in 2000, we offered classes at both Libertyville and Vernon Hills for the first time, and Augusoft registration software was purchased, and that's where most of my statistics um, for what you're gonna see the rest of the program come from. Um, prior to that, it was all done by hand um, and on computers, um, and we don't have those records, unfortunately. But in 2006, we had the first evidence of branding, lighting the path for community education, the familiar light bulb that I try to incorporate into every catalog cover. Um, we started online partnerships with Ed2Go, and a partnership with District 214's travel program so that we could offer programs, um, day trips um, into the city, um, for example, going to see Hamilton, overnight uh, trips, and international travel. And we started offering classes to youth and family. Um, in 2007, we, partnered, we started a partnership with um, Stevenson High School Prep Program, which is our neighbor. And Buzz Perry actually came up with the idea um, to incorporate, instead of competing against each other, to kind of form a partnership so that we could offer more classes, cross-advertise, and um, reach all of our community members in a more positive way. Um, in 2012, Don Shoup had a brainchild of an idea um, called the North Suburban Wind Ensemble. If you haven't been to one of the concerts, I really ask that you come. It's amazing. If you close your eyes, it sounds like you're in Chicago. Um, it's formed with musicians that are typical band um, and orchestra teachers um, in our area, and they are just phenomenal. Our next concert's November 11th. And then we started offering STEM classes um, through Engineering for Kids in um, 2014, and now we offer STEM classes ages four through 14, and they are just the coolest classes um, to watch them build robots and then fight against each other or come up with different ways um, that engineers of the future are getting trained. And then Last year, we offered, um, started offering veteran discounts um, to kind of honor the, the service people that we have in our community and bring them into our program. So the common aspect for the last 70 years is that our classes are all open to the public, um, our school districts and surrounding communities. We still offer senior discounts. Our classes are ever-changing to meet the needs of our community. We're very self-supportive and we offer quality classes at reasonable prices. And we are also um, recognized both nationally and um, in the state of Illinois. Um, some awards that we've won as a program, uh, the LEARN program is the Learning Resource Network or a, um, a large group of about 9,000 members that our park district, um, or community college, and uh, community education programs. In 2007, um, the inter we, were re we received the International Award of Excellence for our internet homepage, and in 2015, we received the International Award in Management Practices. The state of Illinois level, the Illinois chapter of the National School PR Association, or INSBRA, um, in 2012, we received the Communication Contest Award of Excellence for our winter-spring 
2012 catalog, and in 2016, the Communications Contest Award of Merit for Special Purpose Communication. And locally, last year we were recognized by the GLMV, Chamber of Commerce, um, as a recipient of their Educational Leadership Award. Partnerships make our program. We have 49 partnerships for this upcoming fall um, catalog. And besides the two that I mentioned before, the District 214 Travel Program and the Stevenson High School Prep Program, we offer classes through Ed2Go, You Got Class, and CCI, which allows us to offer five, over 500 online courses. Um, you can take at your own time and leisure. Um, we partner with Concordia University um, as a core location um, for their um, educational administration um, degrees. And um, I'm not going to read all of these, but I just want to point out, this is just a partial list of the 49. Countryside Fire Protection District, REI, opening up a store. Um, they're teaching wonderful classes at our location. Waukegan Power Squadron, Lake County Composite Civil Air Patrol. Um, we've tripled the membership in that organization by offering classes um, through our program. Lake County Emergency Management, if you want to learn severe weather spotter training, um, they are part of our group. Um, and we have people that are coming from Kenosha. I talked about the drone class, um, AeroWorks um, Productions and Engineering for Kids, um, financial um, partnership now with Trinell um, Financial Group and World Equity to talk about retirement planning. And one that I um, really appreciated um, coming on board is the Brookdale Hawthorne Lake Senior Living Solutions to talk about um, transitioning into senior living facilities. Um, and we uh, had really good um, communication and evaluation of that. And I'm going to go on and on. But I'm really proud this year. Um, we have Gail Gant, who is a noted um, pastry chef, coming into our program and teaching a class. And Chicago radio announcer Harvey Wittenberg um, is going to do a Hockey 101 and talk about his book, Blackhawks Locker Room Talk. I'm almost done. Advertising. Um, I hope by now that you have received our um, light bulb catalog um, for the fall classes. We mail them to over 41,000 residents um, in our uh, area. And I deliver to the catalogs to 12 libraries, two senior centers, one village hall, and eight local businesses that ask me every time to bring the catalogs there to give to their customers. And we utilize a lot of free resources for advertising, Twitter, Facebook, ePaw Prints, thank you, Mary, um, the D128 website, the Daily Herald, um, all of our classes are listed in their calendar. And finally, the Libertyville patch has all of our classes listed. Students, don't, are, they come not from just our area, but we have 58 different communities that have registered in the last year for our, to participate in our program. The obvious ones are Libertyville, Mundelein, Vernon Hills, Buffalo Grove, um, but we have people come as far away as Chicago, Lockport, Elk Grove Village, Elgin, Crystal Lake, Mount Prospect, uh, Woodstock, St. Charles, and then um, even those people in Wisconsin, Daniel, um, New Berlin, uh, Trevor, and Kenosha. Um, last year in the fall, we had 583 registrations um, for our 100 uh, in 85 classes. And this last semester, our winter spring, we had an increase in registrations to 692 participants in our 208 classes. And our instructors. Um, Last semester, we had 62 instructors in our program, 13 of which were new, that wanted to teach for us, uh, to teach their specialty or their interest. And this fall term, we have 72, 76 instructors, sorry, and 13 of those are new. Um, 15 of our instructors have taught with our program since at least 2004, when we had our registration program um, purchased. So now, I have two people that I have asked to um, join me in my presentation. Um, instead of just hearing me talk, I'd like to introduce one of our instructors, Tony Rodkey. And I'm going to ask him a few questions. Um, and yes, we kind of did uh, put this together ahead of time. <laughs> Tony, why do you teach for our program? 
Well, it really gives me an opportunity to do what I love and share the messages and initially the fire behavior and fire extinguishers training. Tell us a little, about, a little bit about the classes that you're going to offer this fall. Well, I have a real passion for cooking and most recently we did the barbecue grilling class and that was a lot of fun. I actually thought Dan was in it, but it was somebody else. Please forgive me for that. But uh, if you get a chance, take it. It's a lot of fun. And we've expanded out to a little sausage and meatballs this uh, September 20th with Jerry Maselli, the 2016 Outdoor Education Teacher of the Year. Myself, we're going to do that, and that's going to be a lot of fun. So I hope you guys can make it and share, share, share the information with everybody you know. And there's one other class that you have a passion for, fire safety. <clears throat> well... Fire prevention is my role at Countryside Fire District, so we'd rather prevent fires from occurring and, and prevent the disasters that do occur occasionally, unfortunately. So if we can get the message out there to prevent fires, it's going to be better than having to go put them out. So. And Tony, what results are you um, trying to achieve by teaching in our program? Just, just sharing my... Uh, my passion for fire safety and, and cooking, of course, and having some fun. And, and it, it really has been. And I have to say that uh, Diane's been a real inspiration. So thank you for having me. And we appreciate you. And I have a student um, that has joined me, Carolyn Albertson. And again, our software um, came into existence in 2004. But since that time, Carolyn has signed up for 80 community ed classes. And this fall, she has 11 classes that she's going to be taking. And again, not script, but I'm going to ask her some questions. So Carolyn, can you join me? Thank you for the opportunity to be here. Um, Carolyn, why do, you take, why do you continue to take classes in District 128's program? Well, I'm a firm believer in lifelong learning, and I love taking classes, and I love learning new things. And the variety of classes that are offered give me that chance. It was really a trip down memory lane seeing some of those old classes. I took country western line dancing. I took how to cook with a walk. I took um, Chinese cooking. I took all kinds of things way back. I think I started in the 70s when I first moved to Libertyville. And then it became a good excuse to um, leave work after 10 hours and enjoy myself. And I just continue to find things that I want to do and want to learn. Um, do you have any suggestions for our program? I would say keep up the good work. Um, certainly to continue to increase the variety of classes and the depth of classes. I really found my passion by starting a watercolor class 18 years ago, and now I take at least three art classes each semester. And that enables me to build and hone a skill. So I would suggest having continuing classes that allow someone to build skills. And the last question that I have is, can you tell us, you signed up for 11 classes this fall. Um, can you tell us a few of those? and why maybe you're, you'd pick those. I know you talked about your art classes. Yeah, so there are at least three art classes there. I love watercolor, I love drawing, I love colored pencil, and I'm doing pet portraits. I'm also doing the French cheese class, I'm doing the sourdough bread class, I'm doing um, how to stay private online, and just you know to show my kids that I, you know, I'm kind of with it, I'm doing Instagram and Snapchat. Um, I think there's another. Oh, certainly I couldn't forget Italian holiday suite. <laughs> yes. Um, is there anything else you would like to add? Yes, I would just like to thank the board. I think that this is probably one of the best assets that Libertyville Vernon Hills has. And I would, I've shared this information. I brought, in fact, I brought friends in from uh, Wisconsin to attend these classes. And I just think that this is one of the greatest things we have in the community. Thank you. So I'd like to end by just saying, um, help us celebrate our 70th anniversary of um, taking class, take a class or two or three or 11 
um, just like Carolyn. Um, but, you know, to kind of talk about, um, I'd like to just thank the Board of Education and the school principals, because um, I know we utilize their buildings at night um, pretty heavily. We're the third school. But um, without your continued support, um, you know, I don't think we'd have the opportunity to offer um, the wide variety of classes that we do. So um, thank you for allowing um, the community education program to continue lighting the path for community education. Diane, uh, stay there for a minute before you go. You know, eight, eight years ago, Buzz Perry retired, or nine years ago, I guess, and uh, Buzz retired, and uh, Diane had done her entire uh, career in District 128, which was already pretty extensive at that point, at Libertyville High School, and um, just had great anchors among the staff and parents and community uh, there and among generations of, of students uh, that went through that school in, in a variety of the roles that she played over there. Um, and I asked her to take a challenge on. Uh, you saw Buzz Perry's name on there earlier, and Buzz did a great job, um, you know, kind of taking the 128 community education program to the next level. And uh, I really thought Diane had a very special skill set to be able to do what we do so well here, and that is continue to take things that are already great to the next level. And uh, Diane accepted that challenge, and you have just witnessed and seen uh, some of the great successes and uh, the number of classes that are offered now and how that program has grown. Uh, with some very authentic uh, testimony from both um, a teacher and uh, a student in those classes. So Diane, uh, just on behalf of the board, the district administration, and me personally, uh, thank you for uh, your taking on that challenge and doing the job that I knew you were going to do, and uh, you've done that and more. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right, moving on. Um, let's get updates from our new student school board reps. Why don't you, as you, as you speak, why don't you uh, say your name and which school you're from since it's your first chance, okay? Hi, I'm Caitlin. I'm from Vernon Hills. Um, the start of this school year marked the end of what was the IRC and the beginning of the ARC at Vernon Hills High School. Parts of this academic resource center are the same, which include the teacher help desks and the testing center. Um, but there's many notable changes as well. In addition to the traditional math and writing help desks, we now have science teachers available during uh, most periods of the day, as well as Spanish and French teachers available for a few periods, which will certainly benefit many students. Um, the most notable change, however, is the addition of a peer tutoring center, which launched today. We have nearly 300 students who have volunteered to help tutor their peers, and the, st the center will be staffed during all eight periods, as well as before and after school. It will certainly be a wonderful resource for students who want to drop in during a free period to get some extra help with a difficult concept or review before an upcoming test. Um, when asked why they volunteered to tutor, many students have referenced the concept seen in the district's new mission statement, DARING. The acronym stands for Dreamers and Doers, Aware, Resilient and Healthy, Inquisitive, Nimble, and Global. The purpose of this new mission statement is to represent the qualities our school district hopes to instill in its graduates and to provide students with a vision for their time here and in their futures. Already, staff have been making the mission statement present throughout the school. Mr. Cortez, the AP research teacher at Vernon Hills, has been using it as a reference for us as we create goals for the upcoming year. And Coach McCallew, the boys' soccer coach, has also been incorporating the mission statement, especially focusing on the global and resilient and healthy aspects. Their team embraces diversity among members and celebrates their differences, often practicing speaking in others' native languages to learn from each other. They also work on healthy habits and focus on resilience when they're down in the game to fight through adversity they may face. In terms of summer travel, we had a group of students that went to Iceland with two of our science teachers, and when talking to the students who went, they all seemed to have a fantastic experience and mentioned getting to see so much even in a short amount of time. They visited various places throughout the country, such as the Blue Lagoon, they toured waterfalls and geysers and got to hike a glacier. We also sent four D128 students and a few staff members to Berlin to attend the Global Youth Leadership Conference. The three-day conference focused on the question of technology's role in today's society. Along with 2,000 other students from around the world, 
the four D128 students got to hear from valuable speakers and collaborate on a large group project to present at the end of the conference. The one Vernon Hill student, Junior Gavin White, said he really enjoyed the opportunity to meet so many people from different cultures around the world. He said one of the biggest takeaways from the trip was that no matter how different people are, they can still come together to accomplish new things. Hi, I'm Taylor Vaughn. I'm a senior at Vernon Hills High School, and special recognition goes out to muralist Sneha Akarati, who over the summer took weeks to create two murals in, Ver in the halls of Vernon Hills High School. One mural represents our new mission statement, Daring, and the other mur mural <laughs> represents VH Unite, our school's diversity initiative. Both murals were well-crafted and remind students of the most important pillars of Vernon Hills. Sneha feels that making these murals was a way to put a smile on passerby or students rushing to class. These murals gave her the opportunity to express her incomparable gratitude that comes with the responsibility of presenting a concept that represents something bigger than her individual footprint. Sneha's murals add a great accent to the hallways of Vernon Hills, so we thank her for her beautiful work. The new start time has been one of the most clear changes to our 2018-2019 school year. We board reps sent out a survey to juniors and seniors that showed over 99% of 250 students that took the survey feel more productive during classes due to the later start. Um, most feel much better rested and prepared for, now, for school now in comparison to the 755 start last year. One of the most prevalent critiques of the later start was the removal of late start, late start Wednesdays. A majority of students believe that with the new start, a late start should be given every one or two months. Some students say that having the late start to look forward to made them feel excited for school and more productive during classes. We would like to take a moment to thank the board for allocating the money towards the remodeling of multiple science classrooms in Vernon Hills. AP chemistry teacher Ms. Stout believes that the added space and layout has had a crucial impact on her teaching style and ability. The new space has been able to allow students for more hands-on experience during class, which is critical to properly understanding concepts behind most sciences. Uh, the new t lab tables allow great versatility and the abilities of students who are now able to freely move throughout the classroom and work in groups no matter how large or how small. One student claims that lab tables as desks allows a much easier way to communicate with peers and believes that, that the new science rooms have greatly aided her understanding of AP chemistry. Hi, I'm Brandon Kim. Hi, I'm Brandon Kim, and I also go to Vernon Hills High School. Um, we are also very happy about the new instructional furniture in our English classrooms. Uh, wheeled desks have transferred the in intimacy of these rooms, and it gave opportunities for new teaching models and collaborative group activities. And again, we are thankful for the, uh, the board's appropriations, which we have now used to better our, our classroom experiences. And so I'd also like to talk about the VH Give initiative that we have in our school. And it is a student support initiative that works to encourage kindness and positivity to make our school and community an all around better place. And this past Friday, uh, student ambassadors presented the first theme of the year, Give Commitment, which is the idea that to accomplish anything, we have to not just speak its terms, but carry them forward every day, and that by doing so, we can build our character and become better individuals. And VH Give is one of the many models in our school that encompasses the Daring Initiative and its purpose. Um, we would also like to give a shout out to the Chicago Bears for organizing a community, community outreach event past Wednesday. 5,000 tickets were given out to everyone in the area, and our, and our cheerleaders, dance team, pep band, and uh, drum corps had the opportunity to perform at the event. Um, our football team had the opportunity to practice at Hallis Hall that same afternoon. So while the Bears took control of all aspects of the event, our parent boosters and concessions uh, personnel facilitated all of the food, and VHHS boosters earned nearly $4,000 that go back to, the, to meet the needs of our students and programs. Uh, we also ended the second week of school with our annual kickoff dance. Uh, 560 uh, VHHS students came to the dance. The highlight of the night was our senior class lip sync competition. With originality and energy, all teams brought exciting live performances at kickoff. And to conclude the night, Finesse won senior class lip sync, and they will pe be performing in the fall recognition assembly in front of the school. Um, as of the 2018-19 school year, uh, sophomore IA IHSA student athletes now have the option of exempting from their PE classes alongside the upperclassmen. So sophomore Zach Hansen reasoned that he took the fall exem PE exemption because of his concerns with his GPA, um, overworking with sports after school, and because it's simply available to him. Um, so initially there were some concerns about how the school could support extra seating in study halls and drop-in areas. However, as of the fall, 
only 105 students have exempted relative to last year's 102, and of the 105, only 16 are sophomores. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Kat Corliss and I'm from Libertyville High School. Um, I'm going to start us off with some sports updates. Um, on Friday, Libertyville had our first home football game against Highland Park. Um, it was an awesome night of fun and school unity. Libertyville sc students were decked out in their Hawaiian gear and we had an amazing performance from the cheerleading dance and the marching band and our football team gave it their all. Libertyville had a very strong performance and it was a very close game. Um, with Highland Park just edging out Libertyville after overtime. The good news is Dr. Colentes gets a free lunch, but you might see him around town sporting a Highland, Park's Highland Park Giants jersey. Ooh, yes. <laughs> the girls' volleyball team had their first big tournament this weekend. The tournament was a great experience to learn from, and the team has grown closer, united by their efforts to continue improving throughout the season. Um, they performed well and are enthusiastic about their game that is currently going on. And boys soccer had their first game against Lions Township on Saturday, winning 4-1. There was awesome support around the community, and they played their first home game on Thursday against Buffalo Grove. Um, in regards to the later start times, um, they're making life so much easier for the students at Libertyville. Upperclassmen are extremely grateful that early birds classes are more manageable, starting at 8.22 instead of 7 o'clock a.m. And everybody loves the ability to wake up closer to 8 rather than at 6. <laughs> Students are arriving at school more energized and ready to learn. A new hat policy was implemented at the start of the school year, which allows students to wear hats indoors. There is some flexibility on the rule in individual classrooms, but for the most part, students are liking that they get more freedom about their hat choices. Students are enjoying the new policy and remain respectful to individual teachers' rules. The new parking system that was um, implemented this year is a huge success. Many students are enjoying the benefits of the new carpooling system, and a lot of groups had a blast painting, the, um, painting their own custom carpool spots. The parking lot is now filled with color and the most amazing designs, and even now, students who missed the initial painting date are excited and planning to paint their spots as soon as possible. Even with the pool construction closing up a lot of spaces on campus, only 10 to 15 seniors had to park at Brainerd this year due to the popularity of the carpool option. Everyone else got a spot on campus. And around 15 spots on Brainerd are currently painted blue to show that they are reserved for the seniors, while the rest of the Brainerd lot is free to sophomores and juniors, first come, first serve. Over the summer, the Spanish uh, language department got the opportunity to travel to northern Spain. And when I spoke to the head of the language department, Mrs. Getch, who was accompanying the students um, on the trip, she pointed out one highlight of the trip was getting to see a student speak spontaneously in Spanish to a vendor at a local market and found that to be a very rewarding experience. Um, the Cat Creativity Lab has been a huge hit in our school. This new maker space has been attracting students who look to relieve stress or develop STEM skills in a um, risk-free zone. This week, students independently learned how to use 3D pens. The heads of the lab are amazed at the success of the student-driven environment, from its creation from LHS graduate Stacy Zhang to the students who use the space and learned to use the innovative programs that are provided. People are extremely excited to see how the lab will continue to grow in the future. The students are also excited about the new air conditioning on the second floor, which makes these hot summer days a lot more comfortable in the building. Teachers too. <laughs> There are a few issues here and there, but since it's new and the company is still programming and fine-tuning it, we are optimistic that the new air conditioning will soon be perfect. All right, so hi, I'm Matthew Huang, and I'm a senior at Libertyville High School. So a new school store is run by a new school store run by students is opening up in September. A collaboration between the vocational ed and entrepreneurship classes. Named Wildcat Warehouse, the store plans to sell snacks and school items that students will need to need throughout their day. It's an awesome opportunity for students to learn and gain real life business experience. The students are also benefiting from the new furniture in the halls, often using the space between the tiring or challenging classes to take a brief mental break. Students love the brand new collaboration room. An AP environmental science student has commented that the layout of the room encourages open discussion and prevents anyone from feeling isolated as compared to the traditional rows in an ordinary classroom. So many classrooms also received a major renovation, and the students love them. The new drop-in lab is a hit, and the students like the new iPads and the layout of the new International Languages Lab. When I surveyed all of the computer science classes, over 95% of students rated it 4 or 5 on a scale of 1 to 5, compared with the old lab's average of 3. 
Everyone loves the new computers, movable desks, and space that allows people to collaborate, an incredibly important aspect of computer science. Recent renovations also brought about the installation of 250 new lockers. Kids are already talking about the lockers and are pleased by the sleek new look. Students who are involved in sports or after school activities are especially looking forward to using these larger lockers as space to store their activities equipment in their own space. This frees up space in the LST in the learning support team rooms for more students to use. All right, so on academics. So students in the new AP environmental science classes are already getting involved in the community through their class. After a recent algae treatment, 400 some fish have turned up dead in Butler Lake. In response, the AP Environmental Science classes launched a project to research the cause of this fish kill and prevent any more from occurring in the future. Students are looking forward to the prospect of presenting their research to the village as a culmination of their efforts. Also, there is a new blended American Studies class that is off to a great start. The course provides an innovative approach to history, a literature, history and literature by teaching thematic history and using modern literature to further develop literary skills and make historical connections. An empathetic classroom environment lets students feel that they can re discuss relatively uncomfortable but important topics and help students make deep connections to the content they learn. Students can easily see the connection between the curriculum's topics and the teachers of the classes, Mrs. Hover and Ms. Greenswag, naturally work well together in a way that students can pick up on and are responding well to. Even early in the school year, students are demonstrating lots of interest in and excitement about the topics this course will cover. Now on fine arts. Um, so it's an exciting time for the musical, as Trials just concluded. This year's musical, Pippin, is going to involve aerial arts. Students will be trained by the Chicago Monkey Arts. And finally, Orchestra is looking forward to an incredible opportunity to travel to Vietnam this year. Orchestra Council member Isabel Greenberg represents the group when she says she's looking forward to experiencing a culture that is drastically different from what we know, and believes that students will be able to understand the culture better now considering how unique it is. When looking at the complicated history between the U.S. and Vietnam, students are especially looking forward to seeing such a significant place in real life. All right, that was, uh, that was fantastic. So um, just a couple comments. One, um, rest assured that your principals and everybody sitting up at the table does a really good job of telling us a lot about the things that you guys do, okay? But I got to tell you, there's something special really about hearing what you're thinking about and just kind of hearing it through your eyes, okay? And so those reports are just fantastic, all right? There's just so many things. And again, there's so much in there for me that what I, what I get most excited about our two high schools is, you know, we know we do a good job of teaching you the reading, writing, arithmetic stuff, but it's all those other things that you guys are doing and reporting on that, that make, make a huge difference, okay? In fact, you know, tell all the tutors it's a great, it's a great gig in college to make a few extra bucks when, you know, first thing to do, first day of class, go down to the athletic department, they're always looking for tutors, okay? Um, but it's, it's just all those things that really make this place so special. So thanks for those great updates. Um, I, I can imagine that was a lot of work to pull all that together. Um, and all I can do is ask you and challenge you to keep working hard at it because nobody tells it like you do. Okay? All right. Any questions or comments? We could probably talk all night about that, but it's five after eight, so we'll, we'll move. Um, superintendent's report. More good news. <coughs> uh, Pat, just before we go, just so uh, the students know the protocol, if you need to leave after your reports, it's okay. Yeah. All right. If you can stay for the whole meeting, that's great. But if you need to exit uh, because you have things to do, we understand. Okay. So, okay. Uh, more good news uh, for this month. Uh, VHHS senior Bobby Black won first place and fourteen hundred dollars at the thirty-third Leonard Falcone International Euphonium and Tuba Festival. The festival attracts thousands of top players from around the globe for a college and high school tuba and euphonium competition. Selection as a semifinalist places students among the top 1% of all participants. Winning is simply remarkable. So congratulations to Bobby Black, international winner in tuba and euphonium. Uh, LHS junior Noah Kublank. Uh, participated in the Chicago Chamber Music Festival earlier this month while they are here in CCMF's Concerto Competition in One. He now has a privilege to perform the Kachurian Kachur uh, Violin Concerto with the Northeastern Illinois University Orchestra on November 20th at 7.30 p.m. at NEIU. 
District 128 was recognized again twice this summer for excellence in financial reporting. In June, the Association of School Business Officials International, or ASBO, awarded the district its Certificate of Excellence in Financial Reporting, the COE. The award recognizes districts that have met the program's high standards for financial reporting and accountability. In July, D128 received the Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting from the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States in Canada, GFOA, for its comprehensive annual financial report called the CAFR. The Certificate of Achievement is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting and its attainment represents a significant accomplishment by a government and its management. So congratulations to Assistant Superintendent for Finance Dan Stanley and his staff for their work in preparing the award-winning CAFR. The DE 128 Business Office staff members include uh, Rhonda Wojciechowski, Rose DeSico, uh, Chris Hahn, Bonnie Young, and Marianne Podizak. Dan, congratulations to you and the team. Great job. Uh, Lindsay Swartz, who is an LHS 07 graduate, recently appeared on America's Got Talent, performing as a member of the Los Angeles-based Angel City Chorale. As an LHS student, she was a four-year member of the choir program. Best of luck to Lindsay and her fellow chorale members as they advance in the competition. And finally this evening, former LHS coach and teacher Carl Jenrick has been named a 2018 inductee to the Lake County High School Sports Hall of Fame. The ceremony is scheduled for Friday, September 21st at 6.45 before the varsity warm-ups for, uh, for the Libertyville versus Waukegan football game in uh, LHS Stadium. We invite all former players, staff, and community members to join us in celebrating the career and accomplishments of Coach Jenrick. So congratulations to Carl. Uh, he had a My great, coach, by the way. He, he had a, he had a great career, uh, District 120. Yeah. And he obviously did a great job, Scott. Um, so uh, Carl's Carl's a good man. He's one of the great ones out there. Uh, next on the <laughs> next on the superintendent's report is approval of the Libertyville High School Vernon Hills High School Federation of Teachers Collective Bargaining Agreement for 2018-19. Uh, it's a very quick. Uh, uh, recap, uh, we spent a number of months negotiating with the teachers union um, on our expiring contract at, toward the end of May. Uh, the two parties agreed to a one-year contract and although this is a new standalone one-year agreement, the contract is based in large part on the um, existing language in the current or uh, the previous contract. Um, teachers will take a soft freeze in this contract and what that means is the teachers will receive a step increase based on uh, moving down the salary schedule for one more year of service with no additional salary increase except for educational, additional education lane changes. So if they got a master's degree or master's plus 30, uh, then they would still move um, across the salary schedule. The average step increase in the soft freeze is 3.3 percent. And of course, one of the main highlights the students talked about um, earlier was within this agreement, uh, the union and the board agreed on key issues to allow um, later start and end times at LHS and VHHS, which um, has been quite a hit with the uh, students and I'm sure their parents as well. So uh, with that, uh, we've talked about the contract, uh, a number of closed sessions and a number of board meetings. Uh, the union ratified the contract when the teachers came back to school um, over, with an overwhelming majority. And so it is our recommendation tonight that the board um, approve uh, that one-year contract. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the collective bargaining agreement for 2018-2019? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? If not, roll call, please. Batson. Aye. Rudy. Aye. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rudy. I'm going to abstain tonight. These folks have spent a lot of time and effort on these issues, and I respect and honor your decisions, but have not come up to speed yet. So. That's fair. Okay. All right. So motion, motion carries. That's good. 
Okay, and before we move on to the next one, I do want to give a special shout out and thanks to Pat and Scott and Kevin. Um, also, the um, administrative team who worked with us on this and Bryant, Rita, Dan, uh, predominantly um, over that course of time. A uh, lot of evenings out uh, in terms of doing that, and uh, the group uh, represented the board and the taxpayers. Um, well, and we have an agreement that will work for us for one year, and then we'll be back negotiating uh, very soon on uh, hopefully a multi-year contract for uh, future years. So thanks to all of you for the time and your wisdom uh, during negotiations. Um, okay, next on the superintendent's report tonight is the approval of the FY19 budget. So if you can um, get the slideshow ready to go, uh, we're just going to do a quick overview. Uh, I'm going to do a quick overview, and then Dan's going to make um, several comments, or maybe more. Okay, if we could go to the next slide. Okay, over the past few years, uh, past few fiscal years, uh, the District 128 Board um, has really done several things that uh, are important to continue to note to the community. Um, first, over a five-year period, the board abated or not collected $18.5 million in property taxes. So the current taxes, had the board um, not abated those property taxes, then all of our property taxes would be higher. It's from our research, it's the largest uh, collective property tax abatement that we can find in the state of Illinois, in the history of Illinois. Uh, so pretty significant. Um, we also so zero. This, yeah. Before we go off, you just kind of maybe put that in layman's terms, what that means based upon the comment we had from a representative who indicated that I think he believed we always charge the maximum amount. It's a great point. Possible. Kevin. I believe this says. Yes. Otherwise. Yes, it does. <laughs> Uh, basically, what in our world, in education, an abatement means um, that um, a taxing body does not collect taxes that they are able to uh, otherwise collect legally um, under current uh, property tax cap legislation. So uh, in that window of time, uh, the board could have collected an additional $18.5 million of taxes, and it made a conscious decision working with us administratively uh, to actually plan for that over an extended period of time uh, to um, help provide some property tax uh, relief for our local uh, taxpayers. About how many years was that? Uh, it was over a five year window. It five was years. two and then a gap year and then two years over over five years. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Did that answer the question? Absolutely. Thanks. Thank you, that was a great question. Uh, in addition, um, we have uh, worked with our buildings, the administration, to zero our building budgets in FY 18, 17, 16. Another way to look at that is flatlined uh, the budgets. Uh, John and Tom have done a great job working with us in their buildings to find efficiencies to allow us to be able to do that. And the other thing uh, that the board is aware from our reporting out last year, but the district, uh, we've reduced five district level posi positions, which is roughly 20% of the previous district level staffing, and that's resulted in roughly $520,000 in annual savings for us. So um, to go uh, back to the point of um, our citizen earlier in the evening, I think the board has demonstrated over a long period of time that it has, um, it recognizes that property taxes are high, uh, it uses effective strategies to try and help where the district can, as evidenced by the abatement and um, our handling of the building budgets and also reducing positions when we have the opportunity um, to do that. And those things are significant and we need to remind uh, our communities of that over a period of time. Okay, you can go to the next Are slide. you going to mention the air conditioning savings, the, the ComEd savings for having the district offices closed on Fridays? Yeah, I was going to have Mark do that a little bit. Great. But Mark, you want to do that now? Just talk about the savings from the air conditioner. The uh, BAS system. The BAS system. Um, we did. Um, yeah, we uh, we upgraded the building automation system. Sorry, we upgraded the building automation system at uh, Libertyville High School that was was outdated. Um, we had done it a few years ago at Vernon Hills High School. Um, so the total cost of 
the upgrade was five hundred sixty thousand uh, dollars. We applied for uh, combat re rebate as well as North Shore gas. Um, so we received a hundred twenty thousand dollar rebate from ComEd as well as a nineteen thousand seven hundred forty. Uh, dollar additional rebate for being a new customer in the new brand new program. Um, we are working on uh, finalizing the paperwork um, is with North Shore Gas as they're coming in and checking our strategy and make sure that we're our uh, setback times and all that uh, follow with our agreement, which will add another uh, uh, if we meet that incentive another twenty two thousand four hundred and ten dollars, <throat> bringing. Uh, our total rebates expected uh, on this project for the $162,150. So um, the initial cost of $560,000 with the rebates, our out-of-pocket cost for this project will be $397,850. And then continuing to realize savings going And we forward. continue to realize savings on a yearly basis. For efficiency. Uh, with efficiencies. Great. Great. It's great. Thank and you. does that also include the amount that the district saves by having the offices closed in the summer times on Friday? Well, when we, uh, this is probably five years maybe. Um, time kind of slips away, but uh, we made the decision to uh, work our regular summer hours Monday through Thursday throughout the school district. So about four o'clock on Thursday afternoon during the summer months, um, actually our uh, air conditioner is ramped down to a maintenance level. Uh, moving forward and depending on how uh, significantly hot it is over the summer, those savings have ranged from thirty-five to $50,000. On an annual um, basis? Yes, on an annual basis. So it's, it's kind of the gift that keeps on giving. Um, and it's a good trade-off because we're still very productive in those four days. We're still working the same amount of hours in our, our normal summer hours in four days. Uh, we do not run our facilities either um, on the weekends. Uh, once we shut the buildings down, we shut the buildings down. The only folks that are in there on the weekends will be our maintenance people. So, good point, Sister. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, okay. I just want to recognize the savings we're having tonight with the Airbnb. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent job. There were some adjustments as John, John I think John was talking earlier, the students were, there were some, oh that was at Libertyville, but there was some uh, ramp up adjustments today, of course when it's really hot, you know, so um, they had some issues here at Vernon Hills during the day, but it is, uh, for those of you at home, it is a little warmer uh, in here tonight. Okay, so in preparation for the budget, and this again is important in, in, uh, to talk to our community about but certainly in light of um, our fellow citizens' comments earlier tonight. Uh, we had two public, public board committee meetings. Um, we had one public hearing. Uh, that notice uh, was in the Daily Herald as required by law. Uh, we've had many additional discussions at other committee meetings, FNF committee meetings, over the last uh, two or three months, and the budget has been publicly posted uh, and updated um, on our website. Uh, in addition, uh, as you know, Mary does a kind of a heavy rotation of publicity for our board meetings and EPOP. You know, there's a board meeting coming up. If you go on the website, any of the websites, the two buildings, um, and the district office, there's always coming events. Uh, and our school board uh, meetings are always listed there. So um, it's important that the public knows that uh, the budget and the levy are two of the most critical things that we do, the administration does with. Uh, the board and uh, the board historically here has taken both of those responsibilities very seriously. Uh, we spend a maximum amount of time on that. Uh, we have very deep and rich discussions uh, around the budget and the board does um, a, a great job in their fiduciary role. Kevin, were you gonna say something? Yeah, no, I wasn't. Uh, Mr. McCormick, I believe that was his name, is probably was not alone and I did receive a lot of complaints and mostly from our the individuals who don't have kids in the schools. Yeah. So I think I want to challenge communications uh, administration to maybe try to figure out a different push versus pull system. And again, you all know what I mean by that. We we kind of put it out there, but the villages are a great example. I today received agendas and things like that on my email, and frankly, I didn't look at them. But the one thing I know I cannot do is go to the village and say, oh, you didn't let me know. Because they didn't. I think I had to register one time like four years ago, check a couple boxes. 
And I, we don't know how much that costs, and it, but it may be worthwhile just to kind of think about doing that. Uh, and again, you guys are the experts, I don't know, but if, I think I want to challenge you because I did hear from more than Mr. McCormick that, and again, it's, I, can, I can feel their frustration. We have, we argue, you don't really argue, you just discuss that we do have a lot of different ways we try to reach you the best we can, but maybe we, we can maybe try to do something different to piece it, so, or figure it out. Sure. And we have a mechanism where citizens can sign up to get the same information like that college. our parents get um, that are more active in school. So we'll, we'll work on that as uh, using that a vehicle and a tool. Yeah, to it'll, do be, that. it'll be awesome. So, okay. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. So um, just to um, review the total budget, all funds. Um, Projected revenue, uh, 86,978,100. Uh, expenditures, 105,905,650, which creates um, an, an appearing deficit of 18,927,550. But um, what we want to remind everyone uh, of is uh, that includes the $20 million for capital projects, the remainder of the LHS pool, and the start of the VHHS. Uh, capital projects and that $20 million is paid from reserves um, and is not going to come from new tax revenue. So it's going to come from um, existing dollars. Uh, can you go to the next slide, please? Okay, so the operating budget, um, once you factor in the uh, reserves after we've accounted for all the expenses and we've used re our reserves to offset uh, the deficit on the last page, Revenue is uh, 86, 100. Expenditures 85, 905, 650 for roughly a million dollar um, surplus uh, as a, a place for us to begin. And then uh, the 2.9% um, increase over the prior year um, on the budget. Dan, do you have any more comments you want to make on that? Yeah, I would, I would, I would just say um, that is true. So as you've seen, and sometimes this kind of happens when you first get your tentative budget and as it kind of goes through various stages based on review and more current information, that surplus has been shrinking a little bit, right? Uh, and so we're right, sitting right around a million. And I would, I would just say from, from my perspective, that's pretty close in terms of, in terms of that when you're talking about 80, 86, call it $100 million, it's a lot of money. Right? And so, so having a surplus at that point. I was doing, I know we've had discussions in the past about um, if you're if you're trying to maintain a certain level of balance that you mathematically have to have some type of surplus in there and I just did some kind of quick math and in order based on 86 billion dollars if you were to keep the trend you mathematically should have at least a six hundred thousand dollar surplus in there to keep your your fund balance percentage consistent year over year um, and that'll so go that's up your, and that'll go up every year uh, it, yeah a very but small that's, your, amount. But that's your rule of thumb as you look at that yeah. No, I'm You're saying in, in order to keep things constant, um, because there's other things you can, uh, th in order, just the, just the idea, in order to, all else being equal for your fund balance percentage to stay consistent, that, that, that's about the, the amount of money you would yeah. need. So, meaning if you, were, if you were looking at a number that is less than 600,000, um, that is not a proper long-term solution right, for our operations. And, and just to be clear, you're talking best practice of having a fund balance, in reserves as a percentage of your expenses. And that's, in essence, what we're working toward after the significant capital expenses that we're going to be potentially talking about in the next few years. We're working to that <coughs> ratio, correct? That is correct. So, Dan, can I ask, can we add one? What, first of all, this slide, will we post this back anywhere? Um, I, nope. Unless you want it, unless you want it to. This was designed for yeah, no, it's a treat for this, so. but, but it's a good day. Because you know, I, I would add one bullet point to this. If I was to take out salary increases, what's our net increase year over year? It's a pretty small number, if I recall. If you took out salary increases, salary increases, salaries represent like seventy percent of our budget. So, as it's a rule of thumb, you could say as salaries go, so shall the budget. So that's that's going to be the the vast majority of our increases related to salary changes. 
For sure. Yeah, but the, the salaries are driving most of the 2.9. So it just yes. it might be helpful to add a bullet point to this, which is, you know, if you took salaries out of the budget and, you know, both years, right, and then you looked at the overall increase in everything else, I think it's closer to 1% or 2%. Yeah, I'd have so to. In other words, I don't know that off the top of my head, but we, yeah, we can. You're essentially that. keeping those that other spending nearly flat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Which I think is an important point. The other stuff we're contractually committed to, so there's not a lot we can do about it. Okay. So again, just for clarification, we talked about 11 percent. We heard earlier by a member of the community. That's really a spending okay. increase, if that's even accurate. Again, we don't know because of the press, but I'm going to take them for what the you know I assume that. That includes our capital. We're really only increasing 2.9 percent on operations. Correct. That is correct. So yeah. what I got, I got a number to clarify for him, if you. What I believe was yeah. reported was the the percentage change in the budget from the fiscal year 18 budget to the fiscal year. That's what it, it added. Total, it added total the, dollars. It added the capital projects. Correct. Though. Correct. Which is. Yeah. Is accurate. True. That budget it's accurate. is changing, but it's not part of the operating. It's coming out of our yeah. reserve funds. Right. So, right. Exactly. So I think that's important to delineate those two items. I think there was. He was also trying to make a connection that that somehow 11 percent will impact his taxes, which is not correct because that 11 yeah. percent is primarily the capital projects that come out of the reserves. Not. It's it's disconnected from the tax rate. Which again, unfortunately, yeah. we very clearly showed in both the committee and budget presentations where we reviewed this in detail. So again, if we can hit the mark a little better in terms of getting people to come out, because I would certainly agree getting nobody out was a surprise in today's environment. But we'll, we'll keep working. And even in previous years, we've only had a small yeah. contingent of three or four people on in a very important topic. Very so, important. Yeah. Is there a, any portion of that presentation that's included with just the posting of the budget? Uh, there's not part of that presentation that's posted with the budget. That was actually a discussion, but if it's something we post on a website, it has to be ADA accessible. Okay. And, and okay. when I was putting the, the together, I wasn't thinking about the sure. accessibility of that being posted on the website. So I'd have we can create something to do that for sure. But that, that was just a, a thing to consider. So if I took exactly whatever we used, I don't think that it would be ADA compliant okay. for our website requirements. Okay. Graphs and slides very challenging. Right. Okay. okay. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here were the expenditure uh, assumption that um, our average step uh, increase or soft freeze for the teachers uh, is 3.3%. Uh, as the board knows, we've added uh, 6.4 additional FTE this year to accommodate enrollment growth at Vernon Hills High School and special education needs, uh, both uh, LHS and VHHS. Uh, medical insurance costs were flat, which um, is unusual, I think. I, I would just note that that I believe is significant, and I don't think it's wise to assume that's going to keep happening. Okay, so course. medical insurance it, it is, it was a, nearly a miracle that it, it turned out the way it did. Yeah, all my years, I've Definitely just never seen that before. Right, so that's actually a good thing for at least one year. In our major surface contracts, uh, food, transportation, facilities, our transportation contract is up 25% for uh, next year, so that should be noted. Next slide. Do we, just one question. On, do we have any enrollment uh, numbers for the first couple of weeks? October 1st. Yeah, October, October 1st, first we do fall enrollment uh, in report. But just to be clear, we do, how, we do know how many kids are here now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, well, but I know Hawthorne was projecting some pretty big numbers again. Um, yes. That's, um, they're still on the They seat. had like 70 kids, 70 new kids enrolled on the first day. Right. They had not been in the school district before. So, at least that's what I saw in there. That's on top of the normal turnover that you know about, right? Board meeting or whatever. So, uh, yes, uh, revenue assumptions, the tax levy uh, will be, um, as we'll see in a minute, it'll be the next uh, discussion that we'll be embarking on. But um, the assumption for the CPI increase for 2018, we know the number is 2.1. Uh, so that, um, you know, would be our cap as we start the levy discussion. Um, Dan through uh, some changes in investments and working our investments. Uh, we've had higher interest income, a decreased corporate personal property replacement ta tax, if you can say that three times, and that trip over it. Um, and uh, the revenue assumptions were based on three state 
quarterly payments, which kind of seems like an oxymoron because it says three quarterly payments, but we actually received five state payments in FY18, uh, which again is very unusual. So we're making the assumption that to balance everything off, we're gonna get three um, this year. We, we don't know for sure yet uh, what that is, but that resulted in some uh, additional um, revenue. And then Dan, one other thing that we did not list as a bullet point that we can add, um, we had a, I would say a significant amount of people that paid their property taxes early, oh, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, based on the change in federal law, you want to comment on that? Yeah, that won't. That doesn't affect any of our budget numbers. It just affected the cash flow when that was received because right. we're Timing, on a right? basis. Right. Yeah. So we. Um, I can't remember the exact number. I want to say it was around 3.7 million of people within our taxing district that paid uh, prepaid their taxes, basically. Uh, so normally, people pay their taxes. You know roughly June, September-ish time period um, with the change in the federal tax law. So in this time, last year in 2017, actually after this probably, probably after we'd all done our budgets and no one really kind of thought much, the changes at the federal level um, prompted a number of people to prepay their 2018 taxes essentially. And so uh, a, a lot of people did that. and. Um, particularly in more affluent areas such as Libertyville, Vernon Hills, you had a fair amount of that. Um, the, uh, the, I know the county's office was a bit overwhelmed with all the money they were receiving and trying to account for this properly and, and keep everything in order. Uh, but then in May, uh, we were given uh, those, pr those prepaid taxes and I believe the amount was about three, we received a bigger chunk of amount but the people who prepaid early, then they weren't paying during the normal cycle. Right. So if the, if I'm looking at the math and accounting for it, the people who prepaid, uh, the effect of that was about 3.7 million uh, in cash that was received in May. Uh, but in terms of how we account for it, 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 it was accrued in the proper year. Uh, so that's reflected in our budget. If it wasn't, if we were cash basis, it would uh, get a little confusing because you would have shown in fiscal year 18 a significant increase and then fiscal year 19 would then have a significant decrease and it could cause, I just think some un, uh, it would cause some confusing questions in terms of how your, how your finances look. Okay, all right, next slide. So what's next? Uh, We're going to recommend that you uh, adopt the budget uh, coming out of um, our many discussions on the budget. And then following that, we'll begin the process for looking at the tax levy, which actually generates the revenue to drive uh, the budget, and that will include meetings, discussion, and decision making. And we'll be looking at September to uh, November for that window, which will still put us before uh, the final window, and that's kind of our normal uh, flow of, of business here. So uh, that's what's next. Uh, Dan, did we, that's good, okay. Uh, so, any other questions from the board? Um, any other comments the administration wants to make? So, um, Pat, the administration is recommending the adoption of the budget as we have discussed and uh, presented. Okay, so is there a motion to approve the fiscal year 19 budget? I move to approve the fiscal year 19 budget. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Grudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Huber? Aye. Luce? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rudy? Abstain. Okay, motion carries. Okay, next on the... Um, I'm, I'm sorry, one point, if I, if I make clarification. Um, uh, everyone needs to sign the budget cover document. There's two originals, so every, every, every person needs to sign just, just before you leave. Thank you. And we'll have to catch up with Jim. Well, Jim didn't vote on it so, uh, tonight because he had to leave early. Okay, uh, anything else on the budget? Okay, next on the superintendent's report is our monthly update on LHS pool project. Mark? Uh, the LHS pool project is going well. Um, the directional boring uh, and the piping for the new electrical service and our ATO uh, is completed. ComEd has been on site pulling all the brand new cables uh, for our primary service, and the switchover is scheduled for September 10th. Uh, what does that mean? 
the switch over? Yeah. When we will be switching over from our present, the way we presently feed the campus, we will be hooking up the automatic transfer, transfer switch and uh, connecting to our cables that go to our building. So we'll be cutting at strategic points and then making the connection. So um, if there is a power outage on the grid that we're presently on, uh, we will automatically switch over to another grid, electrical grid. Which hasn't been true in the past. And we have had at least five significant power outages at Libertyville High School in the 13 years I've been here. So this will help that greatly. So does that happen in the middle of the day? Or I'm, I'm picturing this. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's at, at, I experienced it at, uh, at District 113 at Hound Park, uh, where the village of Highwood and the village of Hound Park were out of power, and high school had power. And it was just a matter of seconds. The lights flickered, and it switched over. So. But does it doesn't happen during the day? Yes, it can happen any time during the day. Pull the switch. I, it just it automatically switches over. But I mean, no, no, yeah. Well, the actual switch. Oh, the switch will happen during the day. We don't have school, school that day. Oh, yeah, that's what that's we're that's trying to do. Yeah. 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 Just in case something happens. Yeah, just in case okay. something happens. Our backup date uh, will be September fifteenth. Okay. That's what we're trying to do. Day where there's no school. Day where there's no school. Yes, no. That's what happens. So that that day there's there's no school and. Actually, Vernon Hills has been very helpful in uh, getting any activities or athletics have all been transferred over to here that day. Okay. Um, and then there's still stuff that can happen at Brainerd because that's off campus. But um, the school essentially was shut down on September 10th. So we're accommodating um, to be able to get everything done on that day. So we didn't want to take, we didn't want to take that risk in the event that there was an issue to go to, I think, Karen's question, earlier question. So. Okay, any other questions on that? Uh, if you've driven by the pool, it's, it's, it's really starting to, all of that back work and pre-work that has to be done, uh, foundation work. So uh, what we had talked about, I had talked to several of you about, is when we go over for committee meetings uh, in September, then uh, we should start one of the two meetings with the tour. Uh, we should look at some of the things that have been done uh, in the building and then walk out by the pool. Okay, and then the next time we're here for the board meeting, I'd like John, start the meeting, I'd like John to take us down to the science classrooms that they mentioned here so you can um, see what the kids were talking about tonight. It's pretty, I pretty wouldn't mind seeing the parking too because I got a feeling it's going to be a good expression of the creativity of the kids. Sure. Yeah, so. yeah. Oh, yeah, that'd be, a, yeah. That'd be yeah. the fun part. Yeah. As long as we don't have an event that night, right, Tom? Where, That's true. They you may know, have parking lot. about prizes for the oh, most creative parking, parking spots parking. or anything yeah. at this year? No. They are looking for judges, though, to help I'm, judge I'm the most creative. The, I'm all for the person who put the uh, Scooby-Doo van. Yeah, that, that was that, that, now that, That's awesome. I like to vote for the mystery Next machine. time. <laughs> next time. I'll be in between. <laughs> okay, we said the case. No, we are just kidding. Um, and are those, those spots are only during the school day, right? They're not going to try to claim them. Yes, they only get them during the school day. Only get them during the day. Okay, uh, next on the superintendent's agenda tonight, proposed additional 69 L space LHS parking plan. Um, we will be at uh, Village Hall tomorrow night at uh, 8 o'clock for uh, the Village Board meeting. The Village is supposed to vote on uh, the plan. Again, I uh, want to compliment um, our team uh, who's worked with John Spoden at the Village as well as the residents in uh, Blueberry Hill uh, neighborhood. And uh, we've come to consensus on uh, the type of screening uh, that should go between the two buildings. We're expecting and hoping uh, tomorrow night. Uh, John's already done a, a, a pre-report to the village uh, board that comes out, much like the information that we send you uh, before a meeting. And um, it really should be tomorrow night, John reporting out on the uh, successful conversation between the district and the neighbors. And then this is what we're going to do. And then. Uh, hopefully the village board uh, will vote for that. Now that vote tomorrow night, just to remind our board, is uh, critical timing wise. Uh, because we're on a construction cycle. And if we miss that cycle, we're not going to be able to do that parking. And if we were to do that parking a year from now, that'll add an additional 6% to um, that project. And it'll delay it a year because of the construction cycle. So uh, the village board acknowledged that, Terry acknowledged that. Uh, at the last meeting, they're very aware of that. Uh, so we're assuming uh, tonight from the good work and conversations uh, that have happened since the last meeting that tomorrow night 
Uh, there'll be a report out, perhaps some questions, you know, a few additional questions from the village trustees, and then we're expecting that the village board will vote in favor of that parking plan, and then we uh, can go get going on our timeline because we're about a month uh, behind on our timeline right now. We can still do what we need to do. We need to have that yes vote tomorrow night. I don't know if you guys want to add anything to that. Okay. We bring I'll, I'll, be, I'll, I'll try to get there. I'll, I'll be there. Okay. Yeah. I got I'll Stephanie there. going to Wisconsin right. tomorrow, so right. Right. if I can get so, that. It's also LHS Open House. Right. So, so yes, if you still have. It is the LHS Open House? What time yes. is it? Sorry. Seven. It starts at 7. No. And then Vernon Hills is Thursday at the uh, same time. Seven. So uh, anyway, as I mentioned to the board earlier, if you have the opportunity, you can be there tomorrow night, but it really should be John reporting back, to, John Spoden reporting back to the village board. Um, thanks again to Bryant and Mary and Dan and Mark and um, our architects and, and uh, engineers and designers for uh, their work on this. So uh, very good. Any other questions on the parking plan? And so if you can't be there tomorrow night, we will make sure that we will let you know what the result of that is as soon as we know it. Uh, okay, we had uh, final thing on the superintendent's report. Uh, we had four uh, FOIAs since our last meeting. On 7-30-18, Steve Rainsford, uh, who lives in Lake of the Hills, uh, requested all communication between faculty and administration using district provided emails and students using school provided emails with the groups Moms Demand Action, A March for Our Lives, Students Demand Action, and Every Town for Gun Safety, date range 214-18 to 713-18. Also, any correspondence regarding these groups and their events uh, with um, then there's email address. Um, and uh, Mindy Leonard and Sarah Frederick uh, Kanisik. Uh, Brian did the follow-up. Uh, response date was on 8-6 and the deadline was on 8-6. Uh, 731 18 uh, Aaron Navarro from NBC5 Chicago. Um, the information requested for the 2017-18 school year, an association or other entity that has as one of its purposes promoting, sponsoring, regulating, or in any manner providing for interscholastic athletics or any form of athletic competition among high schools and high school students within this state shall require all member schools that have certified athletic trainers to complete a monthly report on student athletes at the member school who have sustained a concussion during a school sponsored activity overseen by the athletic trainer or when the athletic director is made aware of a concussion sustained by a um, student uh, during a school sponsored event. All reporting must be anonymous as it relates to student names. Brian, I do not see a response date on this. Um, oh, I'm sorry, here it is on the front page. Uh, response date was 8-17-18, and the deadline was 8-17-18. Brian, in essence, what were they looking for? Because that's a pretty... 8-7. 8-7, 18, and 8 7, 18 for response and deadline. Basically, um, the athletic directors and athletic trainers submit a report to the IHSA. So they wanted the report. As the, as the year goes on, so it's just basically us pulling the report from the IHSA uh, that they put into the school center, and then we send it to NBC. And, and this has been, um, I think NBC's done this for you for a couple of years now. So instead of just saying, here's what we need, we get basically the longer version of that. Okay. Longer version of that, yeah. All right. Thanks. Uh, 81318 uh, from Steve Smart, who's with IBEW uh, in Libertyville, a copy of certified payroll for EJ Electric, who is working at Burnham Hills High School for the months of May 2018, June 2018, and July 2018. Um, I would also like a copy of the bids and proposals for all contractors who bid the electrical package for work at Burnham Hills High School, including dollar amounts. Um, Dan was our um, uh, person who did the follow-up response date was 8-23-2018. Uh, the deadline was 8-20-18. Um, we were still within the deadline because we requested a five-day extension to 8-27-18. And finally, 8-14-18, Smart Procure, Bethany Simpson, Data Acquisition Speci Specialist. Smart Procure is submitting a commercial FOIA request to the Libertyville Vernon Hills High School Community District 128 for any and all purchasing records 
from uh, 5-15, 2018 to current. The request is limited to readily available records without physically copying, scanning, or printing paper documents. Any editable electronic document is acceptable. The specific information requested from your record keeping system is one purchase order number. If purchase orders are not used, a comparable substitute is acceptable, i.e. invoice, encumbrance, or check number. Two, purchase date. Three, line item details, detailed description of the purchase. Four, line item quantity. Five, line item price. Six, vendor ID, name, address, contact person, and their email address. Rose DeSico uh, did our follow-up on this in the business office. Uh, the response date is pending, and our commercial response deadline, uh, which is uh, longer uh, than just a general FOIA, is 9-13-18, and we will certainly be within that deadline. So, so track, I know you used to report the amount of time spent by each of these people to fulfill this request. Is that something that's takes even more time to we can, we can, uh, we, no, I just was we curious. We did that for a while because we, we were receiving significant um, FOIAs from large national groups that required a lot of right. data mining um, on our part. So uh, we'd be happy to do that. I was just, just curious. A ballpark, I, mean, I just was curious. Yeah. Just an estimate. We'd, we'd be, we'd be happy to do that. Uh, I think you will be surprised sometimes at the amount yeah. um, of time, but it's a requirement under state law and right. we we have to do it. So it is what it is okay. uh, moving forward. So, but we can certainly track that. Again, it's not a problem. Yeah, I, I, yeah don't spend a lot of time yeah, on it if it's just ballpark. Just well, we, we have an estimate if Bryant actually does one and he has to gather stuff. I mean, he kind of knows yeah. how much time that takes. So we can, we can do a close estimate on that without adding more workload. Yeah. Uh, OK, okay. Pat, believe it or not, that, that's it. that okay. concludes this. All right, good job. For tonight. All right, consent vote agenda is listed. Uh, we did review this earlier in the month, so if I could ask for a motion to yeah, approve. I just one. Yep. Sure, just one clarification. On the expenses greater than 10 grand, yeah. the explanations you, thank you, put into place. There was, for LHS and BHHS, I think 25K for, it was called July, it was July web store and board subsidies. And it was like 50, over 50K for LHS. Explain what the board subsidies portion of that is, because I want to make sure that pe people understand if they're reading that. The board gets no subsidies, we get nothing, basically. So again, the word board subsidies can you know, raise a red flag to somebody who may be looking for red flags. So you just tell us what that is, if you will. Yeah, uh, so just in, for perspective, so this is a list of of bills and checks that we are sending money out. So when we are sending money out, that's a subsidy that's us subsidizing something, not something subsidizing us. And so what these monies are, these monies are um, monies that have been long standing with the district in terms of supporting various uh, student activities. And so because student activities is a different bank account and we expend the money, uh, this is how we show those expenditures actually happening rather than just transfer them money and book a journal entry or something like that. We literally cut a check and post it and everything like that to, to be more, I guess, transparent in terms of, of how that works. So that's essentially what the, what those are. So board subsidies, <coughs> board paying. The subsidies board is subsidizing. The board is not subsidizing. The board yeah. Not the board receiving subsidies. subsidies. And let's just make this point again, Kevin, that you made earlier, just to make it perfectly clear. Um, there is no financial benefit for school board members, sorry Casey, serving on the board. Um, they get paid nothing, okay? So there are no subsidies to school board members. Thank you. Okay, good question. All right, now is there a motion to approve the consent vote agenda? So moved. Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Hessel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luz. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Epstein. Okay, motion carries. Um, facilities and finance, Chairperson Luce. Okay, okay. Uh, we have three items on here. Um, first is for the Monkey Aerial Arts LLC lease and liability contract and equipment rental. Actually, this was mentioned in our student That's comments. For, yes, for the play. For Pippin. Yep. Yep. So, anything to add on as it relates to the description of this? Mr. Dan? Nope, just a reminder, and particularly for uh, 
in case you're running so this is the the contract to lease the equipment that they're going to be using during Pippin um, to do the aerial things and so that they they, help, they bring the, the kids in the air and you know, fixed position you get to provide a visual for that right. yeah. <laughs> so it includes the equipment and training if I remember it yes. is correct but that's okay. it is correct and the attorneys extensive training yes. <laughs> there is the the meat of this really is in the equipment rental. We want to make sure that we have good equipment and all that kind of stuff. So, and there is an opportunity if board members are interested to try that <laughs> equipment out. So right. after, just if you're just to be clear, clear let us know if you're it's not. It's right. not in the agreement. No. I'll go after Dr. We'll Kalantis. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Thank you. Okay. Um, do we have a motion to approve that contract? And we did go. By the way, we also went in over this in depth in committee. Right. Yes. Um, do we have an approval or a motion to approve the contract? So moved. Second. Any other questions or dialogue? All right. Can we have a roll call, please? Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Lundstedt. Aye. Rooney. Abstain. Rudy. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Okay. That passes. Second item on the list is renewal of agreement for athletic and PE towel services. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. One through this is our annual uh, contract on these type of things, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, last year we bid uh, for one year with the option to renew for two years beyond that. So this this is the renewal we're bringing. It's a zero zero percent change from the previous year. Okay. Do we have a motion to approve and uh, the renewal of the athletic towel contract? So moved. Second. Any discussion or any other questions? All right. Can we have a roll call? Moose? Aye. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? Epstein. Grudy? Aye. Hassel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Last but not least, the disposal request, and this is to uh, get rid of LHS fine art stage equipment. And just to be clear, this was added after our FNF meetings came to us after that, so that's... Anything of note on that, Dan? Okay. Uh, do we have a motion to approve this disposal request? So moved. Second. Second. Any other questions or dialogue on this one? Roll call. Lundstedt? Aye. Rooney? Epstein. Rudy? Aye. Hessel? Aye. Huber? Aye. Loose. Aye. Anything other for facilities and finance committee? Yeah, I just got one thing. Uh, uh, again, I think I want to do a, throw another challenge out there for maybe Mary and press and administration. And that is, we are going to be spending a lot of money on CapEx at Durant Hills and Libertyville, <coughs> potentially, to repurpose things and add things here. Right. And I know did a wonderful job with the Libertyville, well, I think you did a nice job with the Libertyville swimming pool. Getting the community members involved, we had the, you know, the swimming parents. It was just a well thought out way to do that. Any thoughts about some type of a community engagement on these significant capex expenses? Because the last thing I, I want to open us for is we didn't get the opportunity. They may sh may have show up. They may not show up. But we I don't know. But. Uh, and again, I don't need to, just something to think about if we want to go down that path again, more communication. Do you want to have, we had some excellent board candidates uh, when we were interviewing Casey that had some skills, potential advisory committee to the board uh, to help us through this process. We talked about, I don't know. When we get the plans that start to get finalized for some of these projects, we've talked about you know, how we used to use Alex right. to go through and look at certain engineering things that provided value. Um, you know, we had talked about perhaps getting maybe a, an advisory group, the kind of decision-making group, no. an advisory group, just to look at plans to provide um, input or thoughts as it relates to looking at those type of things. So just a thought. I mean, yeah, I think, you know, we've got the possibility to do that. We're on a little different timeline track than we were with the pool. Okay, so if we're going to hit some of the construction markers coming up, um, you know, our, our engineering firm, our architectural firm, 
um, are really, um, based on the direction you gave us at the last meeting, they're working on definitive detail. So our ability to actually, uh, in a detailed way, um, come to a bid, point for bid, our timeline is pretty short on that, uh, given where we're at right now. Now having said that, uh, we can always use you know, out, outside expertise. Uh, Scott, you mentioned Alex Delapala used to do that uh, for us as a board member. Uh, he uh, particularly brought that skill. Um, and in um, kind of his later years on the board, he had retired from Abbott and he had a lot of time to devote to that. So he was able to meet with, with our team and the architects when we were available. So um, I think we can talk about how we can fold that in within the time parameters that you know, we have coming up. Um, you know, moving forward. And then we will continue to do what we did with the swimming pool, and that is, um, as we've made the presentations, have been made to the board about the need for the projects at both the buildings, uh, we'll continue to, um, you know, overemphasize that, communicate um, those things. Uh, again, I think the single biggest, uh, I think the single biggest comment uh, that we might hear, and maybe more particularly from folks at Libertyville, is, well, we don't really need a second gym at Vernon Hills. And what the board has learned is we run parallel physical education programs at both buildings. Uh, we run the same athletic programs at both buildings, and we need additional space. And then uh, the other comment that's gotten a little play, at least with one citizen um, in Libertyville, has been regarding dance facilities for either of the schools. Um, and uh, we have a large number of students that are involved uh, beyond the school day. Uh, we also have a large number of students who use uh, those facilities, who need facilities at both school during the school day. Um, and um, the other issue that we're dealing with with dance is uh, that it's predominantly female, not all female, but it's predominantly female in our district. Um, and we also have some you know, potential equity issues uh, there that we need to be sensitive to. Now we all know it's the right thing to do and that's not what's driving our decision, so I don't, I don't want anybody to be confused about that. Uh, but the reality is that you know, we need to provide uh, those kids uh, dedicated and fixed space, just like we would for kids in other PE classes and other extracurricular activities legally as well as um, kind of practically speaking. So I think we can take a look as uh, our folks are working on the plan and we can see how we can fold some people into that conversation and might be willing to help us. Yeah, and it, equally as importantly, drive community uh, awareness of anything and everything that they can attend to be aware of the process. Right. Yeah, again, I, I think the, the biggest thing I hear is, because I always challenge back and I say, we do that, trust me. We had a great presentation by John and Tom. We had the architect. We had we had everything. We docked her out for two and a half hours. Well, I didn't know about it. Well, I was at a committee meeting. Why didn't you do it on a standalone? Well, I said we tried the budget standalone a little while ago, budget 101, and you know the cost may have been a little bit more than the benefit on that one. Right? So I don't know, but again, I, I may challenge you. Maybe you want to have a CapEx 101 for these specific things where John, because they were great salesmen, right? John and Tom, they showed exactly, they hit the 80% mark for class size, hit this. I mean, it was very. I think to the comment that was made today, um, and this is my belief, there's not a, and I will use the word that was used, a luxury item that is being considered for either one of these schools. Agreed. Yeah. No, and I, so, I think all of us have gotten to that point. And look, but I think it gets back to education. And I think, uh, I shouldn't speak for you, but I will. Uh, well, maybe. I think also is, okay, as we go through this and we move fast and furiously through this process, because there is a time element here. But just making sure that as you do it, is there another sets of eyes that kind of hold even our vendors accountable on some of these costs and who know a little bit more about, oh, you know, well, if you're going to go and do that heating unit, you know, that verse, you know, similarly, I always use the example on the air conditioner or the units on the pool or in, within a closed area that Alex brought to the table. And actually that one, we chose to spend a little bit more money because it would have saved money in the long haul 
by giving something that was more durable. But somebody put a few eyes on that to say, not only, hey, maybe this might cost too much, or you should be thinking longer term and you should make an investment because that will be better sustainability. I don't know, but yeah. those eyes are always kind of good when we're going through this with, with vendors, even though I know we have great expertise as I look at Mr. Koopman here. All right, so can I, do, can I just do a quick review? So the projects that we're looking at at this point, of course, the Libertyville pool. So we're at you know, roughly 21 and a half million is our target for the LHS pool. Okay, we're doing parking there. Okay, that's an additional expense that wasn't part of the original plan. And then there's uh, obviously a need to repurpose the old swimming pool once we can dive into the new swimming pool. And um, what the board is referencing is um, Tom and his team uh, did a presentation. Um, they've gone through a number of processes over the last year. A very in-depth presentation. Yes, looking at the needs uh, of their students. And um, you know we have a plan to move forward that the board has authorized um, our technical folks to do um, additional work on so we can get um, um, you know, a closer estimate on fixed cost uh, with detailed drawings. Uh, conversely, uh, John Gilliam and his team have done a presentation on uh, the needs at Vernon Hills, and uh, those are driven by a couple of things. Um, one, significant enrollment increases in the south end of the district. That uh, Hawthorne is uh, 73, has been experiencing, is continuing to experience, that we uh, are in uh, our third year of uh, growth at uh, Vernon Hills High School. We'll know better when we have the numbers um, in October, what that looks like. Um, but that's one factor. Um, and the projects that um, uh, really need driven at Vernon Hills are the cafeteria. Most of the public is not aware if they're not on the, if they haven't been to this building, uh, where we said tonight that the cafeteria is probably, and this is probably being generous, is probably half the size that it needs to be. So on the top of that priority list, we'll be expanding the cafeteria because the entire educational program here is driven around our ability to feed kids lunch. And um, schedule-wise. Yeah, schedule, and schedule wise. Disruptive. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very disruptive. Um, so uh, that project would push the cafeteria out into the courtyard, uh, retool the serving lines. Uh, that would make more sense to move uh, the maximum number of people in and out in a reasonable uh, amount of time. So that's uh, one piece. The second piece is the addition of eight um, classrooms. Um, initially working with the art architect with the number of students that are here and that we're predicting will be here over the next few years based on our demographic report and um, uh, District 73's demographic report uh, would really be in the neighborhood of 14 to 15 classrooms. And so um, John, again, working with his team and our people and the district office folk to scale that back to, um, you know, seven, eight classrooms to start with one of those being a STEM lab uh, moving forward. The kids are here and they're coming, okay? And it's, when you think about construction, that type of construction, we're really on a two-year cycle. Uh, and we've got to hit a construction cycle to get um, that going. So um, the goal is to have those classrooms constructed before we get the next bulge. And it also allows us the opportunity to every year take a look at the enrollment pattern. And if we need to make a future decision another two years out to add some additional classrooms, uh, we'll have the flexibility to do that. And those classrooms would be constructed that way. And the third piece um, is uh, a second gym. Uh, unlike Libertyville, uh, there's not a second gym at Vernon Hills High School. We run the same physical education programs, we have the same space need there, and then we run the exact same athletic programs uh, at both schools, so the requirements for space is the same uh, at both schools. Um, when the locker rooms were constructed on the front of this building, uh, the additional locker rooms seven or eight years ago, uh, they were built with steel that would support a second floor for a uh, partial second floor dance studio uh, at uh, Vernon Hills that uh, could receive multiple use during the day. Uh, and by our code extracurricular activity. So that would be the third piece of the plan. Again, doing rough numbers uh, on all of those. Uh, we believe if the board makes that decision that um, we have the ability to pay for that with reserves uh, at both campuses and still 
um, have um, a reserve balance that would put us in very good position in comparison to most of the school districts in the state for the future needs of the district. Okay. So, Kevin, I think one more comment I'll make is the one difference, I think, between what we're doing now and the pool, the pool, just the nature of the, what that was, we needed a lot of call it community feedback from people in the swim programs to help us really understand the pool that was most appropriate for us to design, and that was very valuable. This one, I think, is a little more straightforward from that standpoint. So I think here, and we've talked about it, the bigger issue is we need to sell this to everybody because you're right, I hear all the time, it's a luxury. Dance is a luxury. Dance is a luxury. You know how you hardly have any kids in dance. Okay, I think we. I think your numbers were like 700 kids between so, the curriculum and the curriculum. Yeah, 700 is a lot of kids. Okay, uh, they got a lot of kids dancing in cafeterias. I mean, so I'm convinced that this is the right thing to do, and we've been talking about it for a long time, and I haven't always been convinced of that, but I am now. All right. Well, and I just want to say for the public, this isn't new. No, this isn't new. We've before talked about I came on like the board, else. there was a 10 10 year capital plan. For the reserves that were well before my time, even perhaps when you first started, right. that there was an idea yeah. that you did not have to, would not have to go back for a referendum, that these funds would be able to use for long-term capital sustainability. Yeah. And, and again, that's now that to me I would argue now that plan is coming to fruition. Yeah. So it's not I mean, new and out of the. No, I think it's like a lot of things we do. We don't we don't jump into things quickly. We think them through very thoroughly. This one we've thought about for a long time, including we've rejected it in the past, okay? And quite frankly, I think if we didn't see the growth projections coming out of Hawthorne and, and what we've looked at ourselves, it would probably be a different story, okay? At least on, on some of the things we're planning to do. So personally, I'm convinced, but I am also convinced we're going to really have to up our game, maybe not to the level of a referendum type of communication, but we need to up it substantially because within the community we're not seeing the level of support from people that don't really know what we're doing okay I and mean, all you gotta do is follow the chatter on the preserve website you know it's a luxury i don't understand why they don't just cut this cut the spending you know all that kind of good stuff and I, and I think we have to overcome that i think we have a good story to tell i mean i think that's the kind of school and facilities that we need in this community to do what we need to do um but I think we got our work cut out for us to do that. Right. And, 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 and look, and we, can, we can be good at, at communicating that too. Yep. And you know what, if, if we gotta do a, a 101 type thing and, and we hold it and only 30 people show up, I, I don't know what to do, but it was probably great for those 30 people. Okay, and if those people- Call it a coffee, not a 101. It sounds like a class, nobody wants to- Well, serve food, maybe that'll bring it. Um, it helps. Yeah, but I mean, if, if 30 people find, it's each of them find 30 more people, then that's 30 times 30 is 900. So, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Right. But I do think we got to do that because I, I get the sense even a lot of people in Libertyville drive by on 176 and that's something they haven't done in a long time. Oh, what are they doing? You know, I mean, I thought everybody knew there's a pool, but again, you can just follow the preserve site and say not everybody knows we're building a pool and all of a sudden they find out and they think that's a luxury too. Okay. So that was a 10 year pain in our side. That was definitely not a luxury. Okay. All right. Anything? More under other for facilities. All right, I'm done. Okay, all right, program and personnel. Um, Chairperson Batson had to leave, so I'll quickly cover that. Um, listed here are, um, I believe, all of the employee changes since the consent vote agenda in correct. committee, yeah. correct? These are all new ones. All care. right, and so the information on those was included in the packet, so I just need one big motion to approve the employment of employees as listed under item 3A. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion? No. Uh, roll call, please. Rooney. Approve. Uh, Rooney. Aye. Hassel. Aye. Huber. Aye. Luce. Aye. Bonstead. Aye. All right, motion carries. There is no property, no CEDAW, no ISB. So with that, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks. Good night, everybody. Uh, don't leave. You have to sign. Yeah.